welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. Well, John, it's so lovely to have this opportunity to speak with you. And when I was reflecting on, gosh, what do I want to talk to you about? (laughs) There were so many things that came to mind, but um, a piece that really stood out was this idea of the word health care and what health care actually means today and how we've Mm -hmm. languaged this system and mm-hmm. is that language even appropriate for the way we've constructed and designed the system? So I'd love to begin there. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful start because it also is a place where everybody who is listening can be an activist because there's something really kind of directive for us all to think about. And uh, what I'm about to share, I have been actively seeking to shift my language over the last six or seven years. And I invite everybody else to think about it too. You decide whether what's, for, what, what's in it for you. So we use this term healthcare all the time. We talk about healthcare reform. We talk about the healthcare system nearby. The, you know, it's a Swedish healthcare system in Seattle. They're all, but if what we're actually, what they're mainly doing is managing disease, that's not the same as health care. It's not a bad thing. It's a very useful part of everything. But that's not health care. Um, part of what the whole integrative impulse is, is to add health care to the management of disease. The, the deeper issue is that in our country, we have been struggling with a movement, what they say, from volume to value. We've been trying to actually be more focused on value in the disease management that we do in in the regular care because we've mainly been a medical industry. We have been, our our impulses have been to do more. And, And so there's kind of three things. There's the medical industry Mm -hmm. which is mainly involved really not even with prioritizing the best disease management. It's about prioritizing doing the most. And so we end up with books like Overtreated and data from the National Academy of Medicine that says a third to 50% of what we do is waste and much of it harmful because we're behaving as an industry, doing more and tending to do more in tertiary care because that's where the most money is made. Mm -hmm. Then you move to the best disease management and that's a really good thing. We've all benefited from it. I had cancer 10 years ago. The the treatment I got did not have health care as part of it. What we're trying to do is actually move from a, um, a medical industry towards a system that focuses on healthcare. Yeah. The optimal healthcare system has disease, has optimal disease management embedded in it, mm-hmm. right? It's a part of it. It does not follow the medical industry impulses. You know, we need to watch out for that because they're not about health. They're really business considerations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what I invite people to do, um, is to use the right words. If they're talking about a hospital, call it a hospital, or call it a medical delivery organization, because that's, that's, that's a unit of an industry. Mm-hmm. If they're doing very good disease management, call it that. Mm-hmm. If, they're, if, if what you're getting is a suppression of symptoms, which can be also a very useful thing, it can be part of a broader healthcare effort, right? But know what it is. There's, 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 and then there's the creation of health. 
And we have been part of an effort to switch the paradigm of our medicine towards health creation, you know, for decades. Yeah. Yeah, What's wonderful mm -hmm. is that we're seeing that language being used by some key people in conventional medical field. Exactly. And, and, and that's what I want to ask you about, John, because you've been such a part of the shift, you know, and really the, the impact that integrative medicine has made now on um, Western medicine as a whole, I think is starting to be seen more broadly and it's becoming increasingly apparent. And mm -hmm. so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what initially attracted you to the field of integrative medicine and why you felt this was something you wanted to invest your time and energy in? Well, um, you know, I like so many people, I thought I was probably going to be involved for six months or something back in 1983. Um, so um, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a trained researcher. Um, I frankly was not interested in alternative medicine or a user. I was working in politics and journalism and mainly I was involved in efforts to um, at change creation in our broader culture. Uh, some of the ideas from the 60s to be more multicultural and respect more diversity to respect, respect both the male and the female, to reconnect with nature and the natural processes, sustainability, environmentalism, all of that. I came out of that I was invited to a job at a little place that was called the John Bastier College of Naturopathic Medicine um, in, a, in a role where they had a thousand a month for four months. And if I could raise money, they could keep me on longer. Um, when I met the people there and then I went to school on what they were trying to do with medicine, I went, it just, it square checked for this whole set of values that were not only the 60s, but I came from a, a very activist set of parents uh, and a household of activism. It's kind of a liberal Protestant tradition that was very social gospel oriented. And um, uh, it, what I saw reflected um, uh, what I came from and what I wanted to help manifest in life. And so I decided to give myself to it for a little while in 1983. And after and many different are. changes, here <laughs> I am all these years later. All these That's years right. Later. Yeah. But I think you raised um, a really key point there in your story that I wanted to ask you about, which is such an important part of integrative medicine now is looking at equity and access. Mm -hmm. And so how do we make that a part of the fabric of integrative medicine? And I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah. So, I mean, historically, because sort of we were all on the outside, it was... Um, there's been no insurance coverage, and that's frankly the way that most people are able to access healthcare. Um, because of that reality, a lot of people in our field started thinking about models to make it successful as with cash pairing businesses, which then sort of increased this focus on an upper income. You know, the classic is a is a is a as an up, upper income white woman is the classic um, uh, patient from the historic integrative practices. I believe that in order to truly have equity in the access to integrative services, we need to be involved politically. Um, we have 10 years ago, uh, kind of the general field created an organization called Integrative Medicine for the Underserved, which is a wonderful organization. It's im4us.org for anybody who wants to take a look. They're really leading this. They're working with the federally qualified health centers. You know, there are two main policy things which are part of your answer that um, I'm an advisor to them, full disclosure. Um, but there are two main policy initiatives. One was to, to get more coverage of the licensed non-pharmacologic providers, right? So we have more than opioids, for instance, around pain issues, that we have massage, acupuncture, chiropractic, you know, for the pain conditions naturopathic doctors use, et cetera. The second was to have more coverage of group delivered services. So this is a very, very, 
important area for everybody in these fields to do. And frankly, it's not just sort of because it's a way to be cost effective and get to more people. It's actually because adults like to live and, and uh, work interactively. We know this about adults. And so if there's a format that creates that engagement, which is so critical with all of the, 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 um, uh, the behavioral determinants of health, where there's a whole level of engagement with every individual, all of us around that, right? Um, the group is an, it's an obvious place. It's an obvious place to work with nutrition, with mind body, with exercise, with your issues around it, with your challenges inside your family and making change. It's, so it's a, actually, it's a perfect place to go. All it requires is breaking down the entire history of the one-to-one -one relationship <laughs> between patient and provider, which is a long history uh, with a lot of myth built up around it. Um, but but that's a, a huge area for, for beginning to open up and then get those services covered. Uh, I think those are both really good steps, important yeah, steps. Those are key. And you know, I think this this obviously is such a topical conversation because you know, right now I think everybody's trying to scramble in our society to look at how do we increase equity, yeah. how do we increase access and you know, I think thankfully, as um, you've pointed out, the field of integrative medicine has been thinking about this for quite a while, and it, it is yeah. a part of the fabric of what is trying to be created. But I think yeah. we have to stay wholeheartedly committed and invested in this course and, mm -hmm. you know, to not flinch from making this really an, an, a necessity of how we pave the future road. So, so um, you may have seen just on Sunday, I, I put, I put out a notice to leaders of about 20 different organizations who had made statements after uh, the George Floyd incident. Some people, I call it a murder. I believe it was that others prefer to call it a death. The thing that happened stimulated a lot of people to make statements in solidarity. And I, realizing that making a solitary statement is not enough. I said, okay, in six months, I covered a lot of that. Six months, I'm going to come back to you and say, what have you been doing? So if, you, if any of you go to, it's johnweeks-integrator.com, my blog site right there at the top, is responses of 18 different organizations, holistic nurses, academic medical doctors, naturopathic doctors, acupuncturists, um, uh, a whole wide array of folks, a number of different um, universities in the field, um, and uh, integrated medicine for the underserved. And, it, and it's, they're laying out what they have done. It, it was actually, I, I felt good, honestly, about our fields on looking at, they, they each submitted 300 words, right? Um, but many of them had added people to their boards. They realized they didn't have enough diversity. Um, they were changing who their speakers were. The Institute for Functional Medicine went in and has looked through, through all of its curriculum and all of its practices about speaking, said where do we need to be changing what we're teaching. Um, so there's some really, really good work going on. And as a couple of people said, you know, this is the long game. This is um, the long game, that's it's right. It's a long game, you know, and, and we, we've, it's a long way to get to this position mm -hmm. through slavery to Jim Crow, mm -hmm. to the imprisonment of um, inordinate numbers of folks uh, from um, pe people of color, black people, to, to now to really say, okay, how do we, how do we heal it? You know, how, how do we reconcile? How do we, how do we find our way forward? Yeah, I think that's a critically important question to continue to ask and to continue to take action on. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna ask you a little bit because you know, you've paid very careful attention to the way we language things and how we think about medicine. You've been a very, I think, high level thinker in stepping back and looking at the big picture. I know one of the things that um, you shared is how, for example, we might say evidence informed instead of evidence based medicine. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I want to clearly understand in your mind the distinction and why that's so critically important? So um, that's, that's a great question. And um, so the idea of evidence-based medicine, the irony is, is that it grew in conventional biomedicine. 
And so if you have to have a movement for evidence-based medicine, the acknowledgement is, is that you haven't been, which is a first thing for everybody to know, right? There's a feeling that that's what that whole course of medicine has been. But when it was declared in 1996, the guy who declared it basically said evidence-based medicine has three pieces to it. Part of it is the scientific evidence we've accrued. Part of it is the patient's desires. And part of it is the practitioner's experience. So you already are, when people think of evidence, they think about formal research. Mm-hmm. All those are types of evidence. But this um, it, it sort of deifies the randomized controlled trial to call it evidence-based and to assert that's what you're doing as against something with lesser or no evidence. So it already is really an evidence-informed thing that you're doing by including the patient and your own. That term evidence-informed actually grew out of many people who got NIH grants to develop programs in acupuncture schools, naturopathic schools, chiropractic schools, and they and they all realize that you know, um, let's 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 be honest with our language. We're not against evidence. We're in pro research, but let's be honest about what we're involved with has way more ambiguity, and will always have way more ambiguity than the idea of evidence based projects. Right? I mean, you know that, you know, research comes out, and then two years later they say oh, it's wrong. And if it and if it's even if it shows positive, maybe it shows positive on 55% of the people, but then it doesn't work for 45% of the people. If your n is large enough, um, so it's 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 um, it's an over assertion of our ability, sort of, to manage nature and manage the individuality of all of who we are, um, to call it evidence based. And and um, so why not show a little humility? I think that in general, it's good for us to show some humility relative to Yeah, nature. and I, actually, you know what's so funny? As you were saying this, John, I was thinking like, oh, that's a question I really want to get to with you is how do we hold the humility in medicine? Because I think um, we have had a tend- tendency in the medical field to kind of lose that positionality where you recognize fully how much you do not know and a a real acceptance of even the tiny bit of information that we do know um, is, is really quite small relative to all the things that could be known. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of our systems, the way we actually function, there's just a tremendous amount that we're barely beginning to understand. And even our understanding it, when we reflect back on it, you know, 200 years from now, it might turn out to have been quite silly because we were missing, you know, a, a, a core element. Right now. Yeah. So, Something. so how, it, when we think about integrated medicine, when we think about how we want to design our systems of medicine, how could we embed humility in the design of the medical system? What would that look like? You know, maybe things like what you're suggesting in terms of using evidence informed instead of evidence based, but what else mm-hmm. could we do to instill a sense of humility? Um, I would, well, I will say to the integrative community, as I say to um, my naturopathic colleagues, other colleagues that, you know, if you, if we were all as good as we said we were, this would have much faster and more rapid uptake than it has, right? Um, So there are all kinds of questions that we're not so good at. that are kind of obscured in our own projections of who we are. So that's the beginning place is just to acknowledge in, in our part of the universe, uh, what we don't know. And, and, you know, an area that I think is totally fascinating, but understudied and underappreciated is this whole business of, you know, a practitioner who says, if they'd only followed my protocols, you know, have you ever heard that? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And, and when I say, well, you tell me also that you're the type of provider who knows how to reach patients and work with them individually. So I think that perhaps some of what you need to be doing is focusing on how do you reach that person and how do you then shift your protocol to where they are mm-hmm. instead of making them come to you if it's not working for them, then, then change what you're doing 
because you're having a failure. Show some humility here and take on your own part of it. I, I think that, um, you know, in all of life, but in medicine, embracing ambiguity and teaching to ambiguity, that's what evidence informed does, right? It's, it's ambiguous, it's not set, it's not firm. That thing, you strive for something, but you're never there. Um, but once you, once you realize you're in a context of ambiguity, then, then, then you, you're in continuous uncertainty, right? Which is particularly when you, we start thinking about personalized medicine, the microbiome, how different each of us are, uh, getting into uh, you know, genetic looks at one person or another. You, that's what you were referring to, I think. The questions just start opening up at that point. Um, and, and the potential opens up too, right? Um, so um, we all just need a very big dose of, you know, in the integrative uh, dialogue, it's a truism that each party knows the other's shadow, right? And I was aware of this working with the naturopaths when they first got insurance coverage. I did a bunch of work with the uh, uh, insurance commissioner in Washington state in, in trying to bring these different, you know, the chief medical officers of the insurance companies with the head of the naturopathic and chiropractic and uh, acupuncture massage professions and fascinating dialogues. But you know, the, the truism is that what you see of the other's patients is their failures, right? So why would a person come to me if the other guy handled them well, the other person, the other woman handled them well? And so you already are setting up this polarized world where you're landed in what they did. So if you've done something well, then the other would never see them, right? So it, when you get into the dialogue, that's when, and we, we observed this, it was wonderful to see when you got, when we would, I, I, I called my strategy integration is community organizing. Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, we say it's an evidence issue. It's a human relations issue. Mm -hmm. It's fundamentally a human's relations issue that we, I mean, evidence needs to inform it. But if we don't have human beings who are dedicated to seeing and acknowledging that there are people out there who know things that I don't know, who have experiences that I don't know, that maybe it's a shaman, maybe it's somebody using a traditional Chinese medicine product, maybe it's an, an Ayurvedic formula, you know, maybe it's something out of hydrotherapy, who knows, there are things beyond me that I, and from the kind of, the, that, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I need to realize that I'm sitting here sort of partly, you know, um, enabled, to help this patient, that, that there's a lot more in other people's hands mm -hmm. that might be brought to bear here. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's what we need to be, that's, that's the interprofessional team reality uh, we need to be heading toward, whether it's in conventional medicine or the broader integrative world, or between a variety of different you know, integrative providers. They don't use each other as well as they ought to, in my mind, as a right. patient sitting out here. Yeah, and, and I want to go to that, John. You mentioned um, in the podcast that you have experienced yourself the patient side of it through a cancer diagnosis that you had. And I guess I would love to hear you know, what you learned about our medical system from that experience. And also this piece that we're talking about now about how it's all really relationship-centered care, right? That it's human being to human being. That's how we mm -hmm. heal you know, that relationship is essential to the quality of the interaction, you could say. And mm -hmm. so I'd really love to, to hear what you learned based on your personal experience in whatever way you'd like to share it. So, right. Um, so uh, what, what you're hearing here is, a, is the legacy of 33 radiation treatments for throat cancer. Um, I was, in fact, a smoker for many years, an Obama smoker, I say. You know, three or four cigarettes a day. I didn't hide it. I, mean, I didn't lie about it, but I, I tried not to project it. Um, but anyway, it caught up with me. 
part of my work in this world has, has been, you know, as a sort of mediator between different people. I, I'm relatively conservative compared to a lot of the stuff that's out there. When I got my cancer, I thought people, because I was in this field for so long, they started just saying, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? All this stuff. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to be open. I'm going to be open to things I wouldn't normally be open to. I'll tell you just one amazing story. A woman who was a, she was a White House fellow at one point in her life personally got into a healing process and decided that she was a, a shaman. Um, she does a thing on a regular basis with the National Cathedral actually now. She was a family friend. She called me up out of the blue and she said, you want me to do a healing? And I went, well, you're in DC, I'm here. She said, it's okay, we can do it over the phone. I went, okay, I'm, I'm game. I guess I'm game. She said, you know, we can just do it with, with you here or I can do it on my own and then report back. And at this point I'm, you know, oh, well, I, if she wasn't my family friend, I probably would have ended it there. But what came of it was, I would try to make it very short, is she, had been involved in Native American healing, and she wanted me to try to locate who my native healer was. And I'm, I was very skeptical, and she said, well, take your skeptic, put him on your shoulder, let your skeptic sit there, and go, and go ahead and follow along. That worked for me. I didn't have to let go of the skeptic. Mm -hmm. um, she said, who is it? And I went into, okay, I'll play this game. And the voice that came up was, quig, quig. Now, anybody who's read Moby Dick knows that Quig Quig is a spear chucker. What is radiation? When it was, my issue was, after all these years working in some respects as a critic, I now was choosing radiation and chemo. And I had to get, I wanted to get myself fully aligned with what I was doing. And when she, when I said, when, when a Quig Quig came up, it was an image to me of what radiation was. Mm. And then when I went and studied up, it turns out Quig Quig was obsessed with death. He spent his whole time on the boat building a coffin. And at the end, what saved Ishmael after the whale hit the ship was floating away on the coffin. Mm. It's actually kind of a glorious metaphor for the process of cancer treatment, where you are, you are deaf, you're hit with death. Chemotherapy and radiation are death creating to your tissues, right? And yet, I got to float away on the coffin. Mm. It created a metaphor that calmed me, mm. dropped me in mm -hmm. and released me uh, to, to, to give myself to it. Long story, but um, no, it was I one love, example. I love that yeah. story. And, you know, it actually points to something that I would love to discuss with you is, you know, I think about like Joseph Campbell's work and the idea of myth and symbol, and we know how important that is to us as human beings. And yet we haven't done a lot to integrate that into our medical system. And the reason I mention it is I, I find that so many people that I work with what allows them to most authentically understand and express their experience lives in the language of myth and symbol and that kind of architecture and sometimes those big archetypes that, you know, just mm -hmm. like you're describing, that are in narratives, that are in tales, mm -hmm. that are in folklore. But when, when people grab that and, and understand how it is relevant to their current lived experience, it can be a very pivotal moment in their healing journey, uh, yes. very much in yeah. how you were describing it. And so I, I also wonder how could we start to consciously bring that sort of legacy of Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. and symbolism and myth mm -hmm. mythology, how could we consciously integrate that into mm -hmm. the field of integrative medicine, but obviously medicine mm -hmm. as a whole? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell were very big for me in my early 20s, so I'm right with you on that. I, I've loved the evolution of story medicine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but let me tell you how I came to it. So my spouse is a naturopathic doctor licensed in Washington State. And she has an MPH also, which is helpful. Um, but um, 
when she encountered the insurance system, I, she, she's, she's been a major teacher of mine. She, I watched as she went from a practice that without the constraints of insurance was pure story medicine. She took the time to hear the person out, to find out what their storyline was and figure out where things went south and what was going on where they went south. And often, you know, you find origins of things in there. You're nodding and I bet you know the, what I'm talking about. And all the trauma work, of course, that's coming out now is reaffirming that. The insurance industry taught her what she needed to do was tell a different story that she could code to. And she needed to listen to that story. Mm. And that story was not the patient's story. Mm. That was the insurance company's story. So right at that moment, there's a, just a tremendous loss. In truth, what she's tried to do is walk both those worlds at the same time, but what that creates is resentment, right? Um, um, but um, let, let me, um, one of the things I thought of when you ran this, you started this line was, you know, it's a postulate of mine. I would love to have somebody study this. Mm -hmm. um, I've always had this idea in this world, and it's part of what motivates me, that our uh, relationship to our doctors are always shamanic. Mm. It doesn't matter whether it's a short 10-minute visit or it's a long story medicine visit of some kind or long integrative exploration. I think there's been great damage that in that basic job of problem solving about our own lives and our own health, it's been our choice as a culture to teach people we do it through external agents. We, we reduce what we are to something that an external agent can respond to mm. as our way to healing, that that becomes part of us, right? And so when we have other stories, other things in life, complex things often, and we're thinking, how do I problem solve? My postulate is that those who come up in that way of problem solving for such intimate issues as their own health, they'll, they'll go to, well, this is how you problem solve. You look for an external agent, right? You look for, you try to reduce to a simple thing instead of, again, to go back to where we were, instead of appreciating the ambigu ambiguity and the complexity. Mm -hmm. And so part of the, the healing that I believe you as an integrative medical doctor, the naturopaths, the traditional Chinese medicine practitioners are bringing, is they're bringing to, you're bringing to individuals a different kind of problem solving, a different kind of way of thinking your way through a, that then includes determinants, includes personal agency. That's right. right. Yeah. It's not a message that somebody else is going to do it from outside. Oh, I've got to do it. So I, I believe that this influences the way we think about politics. Mm -hmm. It is the way we think about our corporate, you know, plans and it, it, it's how, how we um, mm -hmm. do a lot of our so that's that's what I, I there's probably a study that could go and contact patients <laughs> of yours <laughs> right yeah do a pre-post how do you think about problem solving pre and now right. how do you and think about post. it you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah you know somehow when you were saying that something that was sticking with me was just this idea that it's taking the most intimate of processes and then relocating them, like almost dismembering them from that place of intimacy, creating that externalized process or that external self or entity that needs to then be the one to provide the information or knowledge. Or mm. And so I realized it's almost a rift with the most intimate part of yourself, right? To give that power away to others, right? To other authority, whatever labels yeah. or names we give. And how beautiful it would be if we could support patients in remembering that intimacy with their own body, with their own wisdom, with their own journey, mm. so that the, the power was 
relocated, you know, as it appropriately mm-hmm. should be with inside that individual. And, and it doesn't in any way negate that you can still have an experience of getting support and guidance yes. and help and all the wonderful things that the many forms of medicine mm-hmm. offer. But it just says that fundamentally your healing capacity and power is within and the ability yeah. to, to hear and reconcile what this um, journey is. And that, that mm-hmm. does make me think more of Carl Jung and, you know, more mm-hmm. of like, wait, why are we here in the first place? Yes. Why are we having this lived experience? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so. You know, um, this is a wonderful bridge to what, you know, is one of my uh, happiest feelings about what we in the broader integrative community are creating. Um, but, um, but it speaks exactly to what you're talking about, which is what's going on with the whole health program at the Veterans Administration. You know, um, it's now, you know, for your people who aren't aware of this, there are now 55 veterans medical centers around the country that are arranging their, now I always use the word healthcare, around a whole health concept. It's, it's just beginning in many places. It's not throughout the whole center. Um, it was developed by integrative medical doctor, Tracy Godet, who ran the programs at the Andrew Weil program and then at Duke uh, for many years. And, uh, and then she brought in Ben Kliegler, who was, uh, he's been a profound influencer in that field forever. So they're bringing in concepts that are part of our life into this huge system. Uh, bless the VA, um, under both our Republicans and Democrats for continuing with this. But what they did when they, they, you notice it's not an integrative medicine program. It's not a complementary medicine integration program. It's a whole health program. Yeah. And the center of it is not about bringing acupuncture or massage to medicine. That's not fundamentally what they're about. It's a piece of it. Mm-hmm. What they're about is creating health in these people. Mm-hmm. Now, the, now, where they begin, and this goes to story, and, and what you're talking about is, and this is Tracy Godet, give her credit for this, was we need to help people to locate why they want to be healthy. Yeah. You can't just say, stop smoking, you're, you know, eat different foods, exercise. I mean, have we learned that that doesn't get us where we want to go? <laughs> um, uh, what we need to do is, figure out how to, I mean, we talked about this a bit ago, that how do we access people? So there's a whole structure in 55 medical centers in the US. Wonderfully at the VA, which has where the, the, the idea of health is embedded in a, in a connection to the determinants of health, like housing, employment, mm-hmm. family health, mm-hmm. spouse, kids. Um, and so you're already in a, I mean, that's what we want. We want to have our contacts for our forms of clinical medicine be embedded in a context of broader concern for other influences of health. But in that, you, you need to have the person figure out, why do I actually want to make different choices in my life? Is it because I want to play with my grandkid? Is it because I want to continue to play soccer? For me right now, I just tweaked my back. I want to get back out surfing again. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's motivation. That's, that's my motivation right now. But what she did, I'll finish this, is, is they realized, their first thought was, well, let's give people access to health coaches. Makes sense. That's what health coaches are there for. Then they did a count. How many veterans do we have? How many certified quality health coaches are there? Not so many. So they developed a basic kind of peer counseling method to begin that first step where people who have gone through it end up helping to be teachers and counselors to the others. Mm. So there you are. Look at the empowerment that's happening. Yes. It's the empowerment of the one. It's the empowerment of the group. And then as you move from there, you have access then to non-pharmacologic, human-based, touch-based therapies and treatment. Nothing says anything against the value of all that disease management that's there with drugs 
with surgeries and procedures right. when applied appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, um, we need to be um, focusing on our therapeutic order. And as my friend Pamela Snyder says, and, and I love to say is we need to be transforming the therapeutic order of the nation Mm. not just the therapeutic order in our practices. Yeah. So. Right, right. Um, I want to I wanna ask you, um, John, with everything that you've gone through personally and professionally, so really a combination of the two, what have you come to understand that healing is or what it means to you? What do you think? Mm. What is healing? Healing. Um, well, just for those who don't have as long of a memory, in the 80s, it was not okay to say that word. You were woo-woo. You were not respected, not respectable. So it is, you know, a sign of the times that we can be talking about it. And it's not just us. You see it showing up in conventional medical um, strategic plans and the idea of well-being um, is there. So what is it for me? Um, that's really interesting. I've not been asked it and don't know. Um, this will be a good place to take edits later on. Let me, let me, we're listening. Yeah. Let, let me think for a second here. Um, I suspect that our road to healing it will be through organizing ourselves around a concept that attracted me way long time ago to the naturopathic doctors, which was the idea of the healing power of nature. Mm. Andrew Weil brought it up in an interview I had with him just last week, and he, he wanted to embed that in the definition of integrative medicine. If we're focused on the, the healing power of nature and aiding and abetting it, right? And, and removing the obstacles to cure, that's what one of the things that the naturopathic doctors taught me that I think is just beautiful. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. Two things that you do. You, you remove the obstacles to cure. You try to do less, fewer things that are harmful. And then you, you try to support the healing power. What that does is it gives you humility. You start with humility, right? Because you're trying to understand natural process. You are in service at that moment, right? Um, and I think that's the right relationship to life. That's, that's healing already. That reduces a kind of stress that tells you, I need to control it all. I need to manage it all. It, it, your job is to try to understand and aid, it, aid and abet it in the ways that you can. Um, I suspect that nature, when pursued seriously in this way, will tell us all to chill out. <laughs> will tell us to do a lot less. <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, tell us to dial it back and, you know, that, and, and do some of those, you know, the positive dreams of COVID, you know, that we all, you know, have more time and therefore we're more, more reflective and uh, have more time to think about each other and be perhaps more considerate towards each other and realize how special each encounter can be. Um, So I, I think that's kind of um, a way to get towards healing. Um, you know, in myself, um, a lot of my personal work has, has been really wrestling with family of origin um, mm -hmm. uh, messages and um, 
-hmm. imaginations that I thought were messages, you know. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's been some of my, my own process, which, which, which was what got me into Jung and Joseph Campbell. And In the, the like. first place. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah at, 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 age, really at, age nine, at age 19, this was a disturbed psyche. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> I, I can relate to that, and I remember grabbing onto those guys and thinking, "Oh, a hand, a uh, hand, yeah, a hand on the exactly. other side of it." <laughs> exactly, that's right. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Well, I I think one um, other question that I'd love to ask you while we have this opportunity together is, you're at a stage in your career where you've done so much. You know, you've been involved in integrative medicine. Going into it, you said you thought maybe for six months, but my goodness, it's been a heck of a lot longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> Some decades have passed and you've yeah. stayed in this field. You've had an enormous contribution. You've written the blog, um, the integrator blog that's been, you know, really um, the go-to read, I think, for so many people. And it's helped to lay out what's happening in the field. So it's been an informative and educational. It's, it's brought in a lot of the top philanthropists. So you've played all of these roles. And I know you're, you're, you've indicated to me you're kind of in a transitional point. And I guess I'd love to hear what's, what feels ripe for you. Like what's mm -hmm. next? What, mm -hmm. you know, given everything that you've experienced and where you are today, what feels like it's next? Where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about that a lot and um, actually used a therapist I use from time to time for eight sessions to help kind of organize my thinking about what's coming ahead, knowing that a lot of men in particular, but I think women and men who've been professional identified when they stop working, it's, it's problematic for many people. It was for my father. Um, so I decided I would spend a little time kind of getting myself organized. Um, you know, I, I really want to see, have time to explore whatever I want to without time constraints. Um, and kind of see what rises from within, see what may come in from outside. Um, I think I have some more writing in me. I don't know what. Um, I'm curious to, uh, if it is journalism. Um, I'm really curious to, to actually have time to research more and, and think about things longer and to write less, but perhaps write more deeply. Um, that, that's, that has some appeal. You know, I, I've been joking with my spouse and friends that I'm, I feel like I'm 19 years old again. <laughs> like, who am I now? What am I going to do next? Right. And there's a lot of that. I mean, that's part of what happens to, you know, men who quit is like, oh my God, I had a clear sense of identity. I no longer have it. You know, I'm, I've had a lot of people thank me for my work. And the therapist said, so uh, John, what are you going to do when there's nobody thanking you anymore? <laughs> you know, and you know, I mean, these are actually very real questions. Absolutely. Um, but um, uh uh, I, I am, I know that part of what I will be doing is can reconnecting with myself as a 19 year old would be poet. I like playing with words in those ways. Yeah. Um, I've just started reading a wonderful book that was Pablo Neruda's first book. Oh, uh, the, Chilean, the Chilean poet. Yes. It's called yes. Twilight Crepusculo. Yeah. And, um, um, it's, it's, it's just actually kind of perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, um, it's interesting. I think I have some more to do around healthcare. I, you know, I'm keeping a, sh um, uh, a limited relationship with the journal, mm -hmm. uh, going forward. That's right. uh, so I, and I have some responsibility there. Um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm really giving myself, I, I have a fancy of doing some work around the rights of nature. Um, I have siblings that are involved with, with the Duwamish River that feeds downtown Seattle. Um, I have a sister and a brother who've been freeing up a, a section of the river that was industrial and replanting it. And I go down sometimes to do that. And um, in fact, my dad's, the company my dad was with helped pollute that river. Um, you know, the, 
the, the university education at Stanford that I had was paid in part through polluting that river. So I have some karma there. Um, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued about some environmental things. Um, um, we were building a little um, outside shed for my spouse to work out of. And we, we, there's a law in Portland, Oregon that says that if you tear down a hundred year old, your old house, you have to save the timber. We have some of that timber in the shed. And I thought, what a great law. This is first growth dug fir. This is a, there isn't so much of that left in the world. We should not be breaking it up and turning it into pulp. So I have this little fancy, maybe I'll try to get a law like that passed in Seattle. You know, <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see yeah. there. You've got some, some ideas there to brew it. I've got a lot of ideas kicking around. So uh, I will continue. You know, I'll have time for my paddling and bike riding and exploring nature. Um, That's great. So you'll have, it sounds like you've got some, some good, fun, you quality time that lies ahead, which sounds Yeah, really yeah, cool. yeah. We get my spouse out of her practice and we'll, we'll get to be thinking about some other things too. That's right. So I think the the last thing that I wanted to to ask you, John, um, is if you had some, we'll call them for the sake of this conversation, magical sort of like fairy-like ability to uh -huh. grant a wish to the field of integrative medicine, what do you think that wish would be, or what would what would you grant to the field mm -hmm. as a whole? So. Um I, 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 had, I go to one place quite quickly. I, I'm a very, you know, I come out of politics, as I said. When you don't have money, what you can have is bodies, right? And, and it's what formed our movement in the beginning was what patients wanted something new. They kind of co-created new groups of practitioners, new ways of doing medicine. Then it moved into something. I, I would like to see all of the entities involved with these fields working together in a more concerted way and specifically working together in Washington, D.C. I mean, world's happening, work's happening out in the fields, but ultimately, if it's equity we're talking about, it's access we're talking about, we need to change laws, we need to count votes. Ironically, we have never had, I would say, more than, you know, one full-time lobbyist in Washington, D.C. for the whole field. I mean, the chiropractic field has its own. Basically, acupuncture is spotty. Naturopathic medicine is spotty. Integrative medicine is spotty. Um, uh, so, so all of this change, the potential for change, if we actually are putting people on the ground to go and get in the dialogues, go make friends, go learn how to talk better about what we have to add. You know, that, that, so the first obstacle is us coming together with the commitment to say, we're gonna get in the dialogue like everybody else. I mean, it's a pretty simple game out there about how you play. We've shown that when we can plant people in conversations, which we did through the Academic Collaborative for Integrative Health, where I worked for eight years, we put people on a pain committee that changed the national pain blueprint, right? Right, that's right. If you think about all of the places, you know, what, what's our thinking about prevention? It's not in the planning. Basically, most of our providers are not in the workforce. The workforce planners are not thinking, how do we use acupuncturists, chiropractors, naturopathic doctors? Still, it's a, it's a, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's a kind of an apartheid, if you let me use a very, very strong word, but that they're not, we exist, they're licensed. But when it comes to planning the future of the US healthcare, 400,000 licensed people are not typically, except in the VA, part of that planning structure. And part of that falls on us. It's my belief that if those folks get together, prioritize, that there will be capital from the philanthropic community, from others, 
who appreciate the mission, who will support the white papers, the all all of the all of what needs to happen to power that up. The first steps, you know, as with all healthcare, are from within, right? Mm -hmm. You don't wait for the grant and then move. You move. You clarify. You take your steps. You do what you can with what you have, mm -hmm. and you always be planning to what you would be doing if you had more. You know, I would really love to see um, uh, people, you know, just throughout the 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 key dialogues about health. I mean, there's kind of you know integrative thinking about transportation planning, right? Mm -hmm. Around the environmental, it doesn't need to be done by doctors, but we are, you know, it's a model of thinking about problem solving, about living in relationship to our resources, to nature, to each other. That um, I, I just like to see it spread throughout so many dialogues back there, and it's not waving a magic wand. It's actually um, it's 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 giving the magic kick to the ass, right? <laughs> <laughs> for for us, for right. us to actually take our lives into our own hands and realize that there's there's no basis at this point really for complaining about exclusion because we haven't been present enough back there, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. To 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 really have a, have a right to um, make that kind of a remark. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I so appreciate this conversation with you and it's been um, fun. Yeah. yeah, fun. And, and I guess I just, I also want to say it's really an honor. You've, you've made such a mark in the field as a whole, even though I know you never would have guessed at the start of it where you would have ended up, but um, I'm, I'm just delighted to get the chance to have this dialogue and I've so enjoyed it. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.